Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos over the 1969 classic Introduction to Theoretical Linguistics and moving on to the third lecture covering Chapter 6, Grammatical Structures. Thus far, we have deliberately acted as though all sentences had a totally linear structure as a string of constituents which could more or less be represented by the generic formula A plus B plus C plus D. In this case, we understand the plus sign to be a concatenation operator which joins various elements together but does so in a fixed and particular order. In the case of natural languages we understand the meaning of the sequence to be its isomorphism to the sequence of spoken utterances as they unfold within time but now mapped within the movement from the left hand side to the right hand side of the string. Contrary to expectation though not all rules for generating linguistic content require or even presuppose the concatenation operator. An alternative, which would be perfectly legitimate, would be to write this as instead a set of elements rather than a string, in which case there would be no fixed order among its members. Rather than have the formula rewrite x as the string a plus b plus c, we could have the formula x equals the set a comma b comma c. Etc. It is useful to at least consider such approaches, especially when one realizes that real sentences are not simply linear sequences of fixed elements, but are always made up of multiple layers of immediate constituents. The classic tree diagram, for example, reveals at least three layers even for an extraordinarily simple example. The extremely simple sentence, poor John ran away, is one which we have an intuitive sense should be broken up into two different halves. Even if we don't yet have a name for each of these, we have a sense that poor John, the subject of the sentence, and ran away, the action which that subject is doing, should be thought of as two different parts of the sentence, and we could simply assign why and Z as generic or working titles for these intermediate structures, and X for a working title for the still deeper structure which dominates the entire sentence. Notice that we have deduced multiple layers without even yet specifying whether we are dealing with any specific part of speech, such as a noun, verb, adjective, etc., let alone whether we are dealing with contents that are formally included in, say, a noun phrase or verb phrase. Bears mentioning that as useful as such a tree diagram structure might be, the same information could be um, represented in a still more concise single line format with the notation you find near the bottom of this slide in which you have the uh, curly braces as well as the parentheses and the um, brackets represent different layers of nestedness within the structure but also specifies the part of speech or the type of phrase which we are dealing with. Yet even with these parts of speech factored in, notice we have been able to accomplish this much without even beginning to dabble in any explicit reference to subject and predicate. To return to the contrast between linear concatenation and a multi-layered representation, it is clear that the latter is necessary particularly in order to resolve grammatical ambiguities, such as in phrases where it is not immediately obvious where the parentheses grouping particular items together belong. For example, is a fresh fruit market a market that sells fresh fruit? Or is it a fruit market that happens to be particularly fresh in itself? Is a new fruit market a market that sells only new fruit as opposed to the uh, rotting old fruit that you get at the old fruit market? Or is it just a fruit market that happens to be new to a given neighborhood? A multi-level representation will make explicitly clear what must otherwise be intuitively assumed from context and more so on semantic than grammatical grounds. What about, though, a grammar that will generate the correct constituent structures rather than just the correct sequence of surface-level symbols? Well, we can find this actually through positing the following rewrite rule introduced in Chapter 4 as now explicitly thought of as rules of the form rewrite big X as little x, where little x is a member of the word class big X. This established, we can see that the rewrite rule for a sentence is to rewrite it as noun phrase plus verb phrase, 
the rewrite rule for a verb phrase is to rewrite it as verb plus adverb, etc. It is precisely, though, the order in which these various rewrite operations are executed which will determine how deeply nested within the full structure any given unit might be, because rule one here is required to posit the initial symbol for a sentence uh, denoted by the Greek letter sigma, um, it is the one that is executed first. The terminal nodes, in contrast, consist of terminal symbols denoting the lexical classes, that is to say the actual words, rather than say higher order phrase types, let alone the sentence itself, etc. It is quite clear, though, that one will need a lot more rules than just these three to deal with sentences which actually occur within language. On one hand, for example, one could simply posit a different new rule for each one of, say, the following structures involving the conjunction and. We have, of course, um, sentences with only one and between two nouns, and that could be one rule, but what about a sentence where you have two ands and three nouns? Well, I guess we could give another rule for that, and then another rule still for a sentence with, uh, you know, three ands and four nouns, and so on. The problem here is that even if you try to linearly list out all the variations on this particular rule, you would never actually be able to finish, because there is no theoretical limit on the number of ands that could be strung together. For this reason, it is a recursive rule which can be reapplied an indefinite number of times, rather than a set of many individual rules as such. Other examples of recursive rules include the modification of nouns with adjectives. What's to stop you, really, from saying aloud, angry, violent, disruptive, sports, crazed, drunken, and so on, and so on, and so on, crowd, rioted after their football team lost? What are we to make, though, of the fact that one could arrive at the same generated surface level sentences despite positing multiple underlying grammatical systems? Well, let's just briefly examine categorial grammar to see the difference between strong and weak equivalents. In short, two grammars have weak equivalents if they can generate the same surface level strings and have uh, strong equivalents, in contrast, if they can generate the same underlying constituent structures. Once again, we could put this to the test by comparing the kind of grammar we have been using thus far with the kind of categorical grammar influenced by the Polish logic work of, I'm probably not going to say this right, Adjukowicz and others. Put very briefly, in categorical grammars, there are actually only two fundamental categories. You have the sentence represented by the Greek letter sigma, and you have the noun represented here by the lowercase n. Any other lexical item is considered to be a derived categorical classification, which is evaluated for its ability to be combined with some more fundamental unit. One then uses fractional cancellation to determine if the elements we have posited balance out properly. If one is left at the end with nothing but the symbol for the sentence after all the cancellations are carried out, one can confirm that the conditions to have a grammatical sentence had been satisfied on a quasi-arithmetical level alone. Just as y times x over y equals x because the two y's will cancel out. For example, three times two thirds equals two. If we represent the extremely simple sentence John ran as n times sigma over n, the two n elements, that is to say the noun and the derived element, will cancel each other out, and the remaining sentence symbol will verify that this sentence is indeed a grammatical one. Well, it is clear that these two grammars might seem to be weakly equivalent because each can generate the same surface level structures. They fail the test of strong equivalence because the categorical grammar can only represent the dependence of one element upon another, such as n and derived n, in partial and really indirect terms. By treating the verb ran as such a derived element, we have only a vague idea of dependency, which is really not up to the task of yielding all the nested structures within a phrase structure grammar that we have been examining thus far. 
It would perhaps be more useful now to utilize the resources of distributional interpretation to perform the kind of immediate constituent analysis which would be a more satisfactory than this. This would, for example, allow us to contrast the endocentric constructions, which have identical distribution to at least one of their constituents, with exocentric constructions, which do not. For example, the noun phrase, poor John, has the same distribution as the noun John. That is to say, a noun phrase can reliably be substituted substituted for a noun within a particular string. So this really is an endocentric construction. In contrast, the prepositional phrase in Cleveland is exocentric because it cannot be substituted either for the preposition in nor for the contexts where the noun Cleveland occurs. Just try it yourself if you don't believe me. Among the endocentric constructions themselves, coordinating constructions have the same distribution as each of their constituents taken separately, while subordinate constructions have the same distribution as just one of their constituents. For example, in the noun phrase, poor John, the noun John is considered the head because its distribution is formally the same, while the adjective poor is considered the modifier because its own distribution as an adjective is not identical to that of the whole noun phrase. Modifiers, then, can be recursively stacked up on top of one another with no theoretical limit on how many. For example, there's nothing to stop you from saying poor, old, ugly, incompetent, lazy, self-pitying John. Despite the fact that there are six times more modifiers in this um, phrase, John as the noun is still the head because it is a noun phrase. These rules are necessary to grasp how rewrite rules are possible in the first place, since any rule of the form rewrite A as B plus C is just another way of saying that both sides of the arrow here share a distributional identity, and more precisely, that of set theoretical inclusion. Under this view, the set verb phrases is so expansive as to include both subsets, transitive and intransitive verbs, in that the distribution of the latter are formally included within the distribution of the former. Within a tree structure representation, the left-hand side of the rewrite rule disappears after the execution of the rewrite operation, except as the name of a higher node. Thus far, we have treated rewrite rules as things which can function without any contextual restrictions, but this was largely just to put forth the abstract idea of rewrite rules in a pretty much hypothetical form, which is a good deal simpler than what goes on in real natural languages. In contrast with the context-free rule, rewrite n as n plus and plus n, etc., we will now consider the hypothetical context-sensitive rule, rewrite n as n plus and plus n in the context x plus um, uh, ellipsis plus y. For a very basic example of a context-sensitive rule, just consider the problem of concord or agreement. In many languages, the parts of a sentence must agree with one another in terms of things like gender or number or case, person, etc. Although this is much less obvious in modern English than in so many other languages, even in this language, verbs take on different forms depending on number and person of the subject. Considering the following examples, the dog bites the man, the dog bites the men, the dogs bite the man, the dogs bite the men. How exactly do we know whether to say man or men, or whether to say bite or bites? Well, one way to deal with this would be to posit different rewrite rules for the singular and the plural forms, but still maintain a context-free grammar, such as in the following hypothetical examples. You could have sentence itself divided into the singular sentence in which you have a singular noun phrase and a singular verb phrase denoted by the subscript. You would then have another sentence type within that sent, which would be the plural sentence in which you have a plural noun phrase and a plural verb phrase. Then you would have the rewrite rules for the 
singular verb phrase and the plural verb phrase as different ones with the subscript indicating whether the verb is singular or plural. And then you would do the same thing really for the noun phrase. You would have um, that broken up into singular and plural forms, in which case you would have ultimately um, at the level of actually rewriting the noun itself, a form that um, takes an additional S if the noun is plural, and a form that takes something like, a, I don't know, a void placeholder um, uh, in contrast with the extra S if it is singular. And then you would have the same rewrite rules for the singular and plural forms of verbs, um, adding an S if it is a singular verb, and not adding the S if it is plural. In short, you would rewrite with the additional S only if the noun is plural or if the verb is singular. Represented in a tree structure diagram, this context-free grammar would give you the following model that you can see on the screen. Although in a certain sense, doing things this way totally works, we could still dramatically reduce the total number of rules simply through changing them to context-sensitive ones. Whereas the last system had some 10 rules, the following can do exactly the same thing with only 6. The big difference you'll notice is that the whereas before the rules were pretty ad hoc, simply add an S here, don't add an S there, this one provides the proper structural description that the verb is singular in the context of a singular noun phrase, and a verb is plural in the context of a plural noun phrase. In this sense, the context-sensitive system is more strongly adequate than the context-free one because it is much better at assigning the proper structural description to each sentence. What though really is this deeper structure and why is it so much harder to grasp on a surface level analysis alone? Well, to understand this, we have to return to the problem of linguistic ambiguity. Does the set of words to see, for example, have the same meaning in the following two sentences? The first sentence, Adams are too small to see with the naked eye. And the second sentence, he was too madly in love with her to see anything clearly. Although the exact same set of words appear in each case, that is quite literally to see, we have a sense that the first one has a more maybe objective relation to the atoms, while the second has a more subjective relation to the he who is being described, to put it quite informally. We could rewrite these then as atoms can't be seen because they are too small, and he sees nothing clearly because his emotions have clouded his reasoning. The first one, therefore, is more passive, while the second is more active. And therefore, the first could be rewritten yet again to say, no one can see atoms because they are too small. This series of rewrites, as informal as might be, Evidence of various layers of deep grammar lying below the surface grammar, as well as an implicit set of transformational rules which can take you from that deep structure to the surface structure. These transformational rules shall be the subject of the rest of this video. The example considered on the last side was only one of many, which can be unscrambled through reverse engineering our way to the deep structure. Now we'll consider the most famous and stereotypical example of linguistic ambiguity. Flying planes can be dangerous. Well, is it the act of flying which is described as being dangerous here? Or is it rather the planes themselves which are described as dangerous? Normally, we would just examine the conjugation of the verb be. If it is singular, it refers to the act, which is dangerous. If it's plural, it refers to the machines, which are dangerous. But in the form can be, we lack that particular inflectional information, if you will. More specifically, the ambiguity here is whether flying is functioning as a participle or as a gerund. If it is a participle, then it is an adjective derived from a verb. But if it is a gerund, then it is a noun derived from a verb. Both concerns are ultimately transformational in nature. In order to account for such transformations, one might propose certain supplementary transformational rules which are not necessarily constrained by the form 
of the particular grammar's phrase structure rules. Such transformational rules would be supplementary in the additional sense that they would operate after and upon the output of the phrase structure rules. The phrase structure rules given in syntactic structures itself include the following, which you can basically just read yourself on the screen because they're largely redundant of the rules we've already covered. Um, for our purposes right now, it is most important to note that the output of these phrase structure rules will be a kernel string. A kernel sentence is therefore any sentence which is generated from one kernel string without the application of any optional transformations. Under this view, the simple active declarative sentences could be seen as generated solely by these basic phrase structure rules. Let's consider now, though, the first basic transformational rule of the optional passivization. This was formulated in the book Syntactic Structures as follows. You have the structural analysis of NP-auxiliary-verb-noun phrase and the structural change of x1-x2-x3-x4 rewrite as um, x uh, subscript 4 dash x2 uh, plus b plus n dash x3 dash by dash x1 equivalently but less formally perhaps more intelligibly we could simply say <laughs> that you would um reorder the second uh, sentence to move the um uh, second noun phrase to the front, move the first noun phrase to the end of the sentence, and introduce had been uh, uh, followed by the participle of the verb um, in between. To say it much more clearly, we could say that you would change the man will have read the book to the book will have been read by the man. We must note now that the notion of a domination will allow us to represent these deep structures much better. A symbol is said to dominate everything enclosed within the brackets open immediately after the symbol in question in the phrase marker. For example, the Greek S sigma dominates everything between the leftmost and rightmost bracket because um, that is all included within the sentence. Verb phrase, on the other hand, dominates the verb plus the noun phrase, and so on. Likewise, transformational rules are inherently more powerful than phrase structure rules because they require at least one symbol on the left-hand side of the rewrite arrow to function as a variable which takes as its value any one of the whole class of substrings dominated by that symbol in the phrase marker associated with the string serving as the input to the rule, as Leon says himself. For example, in the passive transformation, SA um, only V is a constant and all else within that formula refer to a variable. Transformational rules, therefore, refer to whole classes of substrings rather than simply to particular substrings. This allows one to dramatically reduce the total number of rules which would otherwise be required to account for so many different types of sentences. We are now able to finally return to the problem of subject-verb-concord by treating it as a properly transformational concern. It might perhaps initially um, Surprise one to learn that Chomsky considered the rule for number concord to be a transformational rule in the book Syntactic Structures, but this makes sense when one realizes that a subject verb concord is formally required in both um, active and passive sentences. Further, transformational rules which must be applied include the rules for the attachment of verbal suffixes and the marking of word boundaries. Finally, if we apply the lexical substitution rules and then the rules to convert string subscript X into the correct phonological form, that is the form that's actually pronounced by the speaker, we we'll have a transformation of in 1C, the man plus void, will plus S, have read plus N, the book plus S, converted to the books will have been read by the man, which will then be converted uh, from man plus void to man, will plus s to will, redden to red as it is an irregular past tense, and then we will get the um, uh, clear transformation from man will have read the books to the books will have been read by the man. This will conclude 
chapter 6. We will move on in the next video to chapters 9 and 10, the final two chapters dealing with semantics. Thank you for watching.